I'll, I'll start talking about this and people that have uh, questions or things um, they can keep asking. So you can see the screen hopefully and it's still recording. Good. So parameter estimation, what are we talking about here? There's, see, there's a lot of subject um, subtopics here that we're um, going to be talking about. That's why it's going to be um, two, the two lectures, so the whole week's on this. There's no um, self-study uh, lectures this week. Um, it's just these two. So you can keep reviewing ones from last week um, if you're not done all those videos, um, and then you can watch these ones. So um, we said this a little bit um, last time, and just kind of returning to it, I guess, because um, why? Because it's, we're going to see how it actually gets carried out now. So it's a better place to discuss it. So we mentioned a little bit last time about um, you know descriptive analysis. So we're trying to like understand the data and explain it better and interpret it. We'll be talking about that a bit more in kind of two weeks when we're doing feature extraction. But we're still in this phase right now of um, trying to uh, make predictions about our data, right? Um, so a very simple way to do that, um, very simple way, um, is to uh, to take a mean of a sample, right? And so try to try to predict some um, some estimation of that data and say, well, here's a way that. Uh, predict what's going to happen next, like, well, what's an average long ease of that feature or um, in the time window. Um, but it doesn't really um, give you a very good uh, kind of uh, detailed prediction. But it is something that often it is an unbiased prediction. So what we're talking about first really is um, defining what we're going to be talking about as a, a parameter estimation by starting with this point estimation um, idea. And then we're going to build that up into um, some of the, the a few more uh, classification algorithms um, that you can see as a parameter estimation. But really, a lot of stuff in machine learning can be seen as parameter estimation. It's just that the parameters get more complex. Um, Um, so what we're trying to do um, is come up with something that predicts um, a statistic or some value about um, a point in the space that the data is coming from, right? And uh, what we're trying to do is identify um, a function that can represent that, right? So this function could have um, some parameters. Um, that represents the same distribution, right? Um, so on the on all this area, right, for this this week's lectures, we're going to be assuming that all the data um, is IID. So we often say that. I just say IID, but I mean independent, identically distributed, right? So we've got a bunch of different data points, and they're all sampled from the, the distribution that they came from um, without any memory or impact about previous samples um, being relevant, right? So if we're sampling from uh, if the data points are coming from um, a Gaussian, uh, we're assuming that the samples are kind of sampled from that according to you know the distribution, but that we don't remember the most recent point when we're sampling it, right? So the order I do these in doesn't matter, and with a really just a true sample of these, so there should be you know more samples near the middle and less on the outside. Which is not always the case, right? If it, if it's if the way that you're sampling them um, happens in the real world or has some kind of echo of, of what the recent samples were, this won't be true. But it's a, it's an assumption that we make, and it helps make all the math work out. Um, but it's 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 an incorrect assumption. So it's one of the area the sources of error that can introduce into your your model when you're talking about applying it to the real world. Um, so what we're talking about is is learning um, a function that um, that given a bunch of these um, data points is going to give us some um, output, which is a statistic of, of the uh, of the data. So it could be like the mean of the of the data, or the variance of the data, or something like that. Um, and so we're calling these um, to be the the um, the estimate 
that we're trying to, the value that we're trying to estimate. Um, right, and so um, for something like if the parameters, it's it's a weird formulation sometimes because what we're if we're saying that we're computing um, the mean here, then this uh, this theta that we're getting here is really um, the mean of, of them, right? So we can see that as a parameter of the true um, underlying distribution, which would be like mu, right? So sometimes the parameter that we're trying to learn um, to um, to fit really from the data could be multiple things, right? So to, to represent a Gaussian um, like we have for this distribution, if we know that uh, the data is distrib distributed as a Gaussian, um, then the parameters are going to be the mean, um, and the variance, right? And so we want to um, learn what those two parameters are given this data. So parameter estimation is trying to reverse kind of engineer what are the correct parameters for this distribution um, to, to give us that, that answer, right? In, in reality, we can't really usually know this, this parameter, so we have to have some kind of estimator. And so that we're gonna have this theta and theta hat, which are like um, the two things that we're trying to, to fit. Um, so an important thing that we talk about here is um, bias versus um, variance. And so um, these are just two different concepts about ways you could be wrong, essentially. Um, the ways your, your model, um, your estimator, um, could be wrong about the data, right? So the ideal thing that you want um, is to be in this quadrant, right, where you have low bias and low variance, right? Um, that your estimator gives prediction, gives values um, that match quite closely with what's um, with what's truly there about the data. If you have a high variance model that's not biased, then um, you'll have basically a bad estimate. Um, it'll be spread out. So really, you know, the um, the data is is something like this, and your estimator is something like this dotted line. It's not wrong in terms of the centering, but it's too wide or something like that, right? Or it's too narrow, right? So the variance could be um, complete could be off but you're still centered right um whereas bias um just refers to something where um you might be really oh, it's really hard to get it to trigger the next color for some reason um where you might be really accurate on the shape but you're offset right and so there's this some um, um offset here um that is incorrect your your mean is off in this case in the simple case of um of a, of a Gaussian distribution, and this is what we call the bias, right? So in this case, you've got a very good model, but it's offset. Of course, you could be bad in both ways. You could have a very weak model that's that's got a wide variance and it's biased, right? And so you really want to avoid that. Um, but these are bad too, right? They're kind of like low mood. This is like, um, so, but these are just different ways that, that uh, a um, estimator could be off. And um, what we want to be able to do is kind of quantify them and analyze different methods that um, that have these these problems. Because bias could be something where it seems like it's very confident. This one is very dangerous, the high high bias, low variance, because it's giving you confident answers. It's really tight, but it's just shifted off by a certain amount in some direction, right? Um, so what are we talking about? Um, a lot of these things, just to review a bit from the probability and stats uh, kind of background, um, one of the things uh, we should have talked about in there is um, expectation, right? So we've got some some probability um, p of um, an event occurring, and um, the expectation is saying. Um, that you're uh, taking the probability event, so x, right, x, um, one, two, three would be actual um, events, um, so some some number, and uh, you want to say what's the probability of that, the the variable taking on that number. So if we've got our Gaussian, um, you know, what's the probability of it of it being uh, five, right? Um, and so you'd have if it's if it's five, then you have the the probability of five is uh, 0.7, then you'd actually have five times um, 0.7, right? This would be the, the probability. Um, 
So the expectation is uh, the actual values of, of the variables times their probability, which gives you basically the average, right? In a simple sense, it's the, it's the average value of a bunch of the variables if you knew the actual probability, right? Um, but that's only when they're equal, right? So if all the probabilities um, are equal and you're just saying like they have a uniform ability to be, uh, to be sampled, um, then that's what we usually call the average of the mean. But an expectation is kind of more general than that because this probability could be a Gaussian or something more complicated, but it gives you a weighted probability, um, a weighted value, right? This is not, um, it's, a, it's a value in the range, um, not a probability, right? But it's, um, it's weighted amongst all of the probabilities. So we're going to use expectations um, a lot here because this kind of gives you the same way when you're getting an average, you know, say, well, what's the average age of the people in this, in this course, right? You think, oh, that's a good estimator for, you know, the age of someone in the course. Um, but if you know something about the distribution, say, well, let's take the average age of PhD students and MN students and staff and instructors, you know, and use those first, then we'll get a better mean that's more representative, right? But you want to know whether, um, when we're talking about um, some estimator that we've come up with, so we're basically put forward a proposal for a way to estimate um, something like the um, the mean of a distribution, and um, we have to put forward a function, like an actual calculation for computing that that mean, and we to figure out is this biased? If we're right, if we know what the distribution is, is this a biased um, estimator? Is it offset? And the way we do that is to mathematically define this bias. Remember, theta hat is our estimate of the thing we're we're computing, right? So theta could be Let's say for now, um, theta is the uh, the mean of, of the of the distribution. We don't know that. We assume we know the form of the distribution, but we let that it's Gaussian, say. Um, but we don't know uh, what the mean is, and so we're trying to learn that. And so we'll say that's what theta is. Theta hat is our estimate of that. And so we want to compute the bias of our estimator, and we say that's defined as the um, expectation of our estimator minus the true um, parameter, so that's the true mean, um, right? And so what we can try to do then is to um, actually calculate that for some uh, for some distributions. So yeah, we'll just go through this. The theory of this first. So if we talk, take a simple distribution, so if somebody's tossing coins, right? Um, so they, they got coins that are coming up, um, heads or, or tails, and we've done um, five flips of this coin, four heads, one tail. This is our data, right? This is our x here. Um, and we know that a coin um, has a probability distribution um, following a Bernoulli distribution, which is um, where we have a probability of the head or tails of the coin coming up as the tails, right? So uh, for a fair coin, a normal coin, um, p equals 0.5, right? Because there's two sides of the coin, a 50-50 chance of happening, right? But p doesn't have to be 0. 0.5. You go to someone on the street and he's trying to like uh, win money off you and he's flipping coins and you're betting money and his, his, co his coin's actually like 0. 0.6 heads, tails, then you're gonna, he's gonna win money off you, right? Um, so you can do that. So p, we don't know. Um, but we say that it is fixed to something, and then we have a bunch of samples, these x's, right? So if, if that's true, then the Bernoulli distribution tells us the probability of us, of the um, next coin being heads, right? Um, because we'll say, um, how many times have we had seen a, uh, a head, and how many times have we seen a tail? Um, we'll say that the p is the probability of heads. So p means heads, one minus p means tails. And this distribution gives you the probability of the next one being heads after you've flipped these, this many, right? Um, so let's finish this part first and I'll go back to um, Ola uh, question. So, um, so say now we want to um, uh, we want to estimate the Bernoulli distribution. So we want to we know that it has some p, but we don't know what it is. And so we're trying to estimate what that p is, right? That's a parameter of this distribution. We want to estimate p. So from now for this part, theta is p. Um, and we can say, well, let's estimate it. Let's just take the mean, right? We'll take the sample mean of all the points. Um, and we'll use that. So what was the the um, 
how many times did we get um, heads and, and take an average, right? So that's something we could propose as a way to estimate this actual probability. So to, do, so to test it, we say we define the bias as the expectation of our estimator minus the actual um, theta, which we don't know. Um, and um, we, we sub it in. So we put our, our formula and we substitute it in here, well, I guess in here, and then we expand it out. Um, so we've got the expectation of that. Remember, expectation is just an operator. So um, if we have the expectation of... Uh, of a formula inside, um, where did we have it? I had it in a previous slide, but right. So expectation of um, x is just um, the sum of x times the probability of x, right? Um, and so a sum that doesn't have n in here or anything, there's no reason you can't um, move this out, right? So it moves outside the sum because that's just a uh, a one over n, and then um, we sum over all the different possibilities. So we sum over all the positive and negative values of the the, the variable and um, the the different cases that we have as well. So the way I have it written out there in the math is a little odd. I found another example that did it more clearly. Sorry, just trying to find a note that I was going to use. Oh, that is it. Okay. Because um, basically, if you summarize this down um, and realize that it just turns out to be P, it's not so obvious from this notation of it. But if you think about what the sum is, um, we're essentially taking um, the sum of the x's, well, the expected values of, of each of them, right? So the expected value of um over all the x is just going to be uh like the um expected value of of um x1 plus the expected value of x2 and for each for each variable right um and then we're taking one over n of that Right, and so if we say that what's the expected, if we just take the average, with well, the expected value for each variable is just going to be p, right? So if we have a variable, um, the coin flip, that what's the expected value of it, we're going to get the probability of it being heads. It's just going to, it's actually going to be the probability p because you'd have um, one meaning heads, zero, zero meaning tails, and you say well, what's the expected value? It'd be p of heads, right? 0.7 if it's or 0.6 if it's this unfair coin. Um, and then this was a very bad n. Since we've got n of these, it's going to be one over n. So um, that's what this this sum will be doing. So you end up getting the um, the actual number um, when it comes down to it. And so we end up with the original uh, theta, which in our case is p, um, which is giving us zero. So um, what it's telling us is that. Um, Basically, the, the formula turns out to be definitely estimating the same thing, and the bias um, equals zero. And what that means is the estimator is unbiased. So when you do this calculation, you put your formula in there, um, and you uh, can calculate this. Then when this gets to zero, you know your, your bias, your estimator is unbiased. So you're not going to have this um, offset, right? So um, as an example of one where that doesn't happen, if we're doing trying to estimate now the variance of our distribution, um, if, right, the goal is to estimate the variance, and we'll say, we'll do the same thing. We'll do the sample variance. We'll compute the variance um, for each step, and we'll take the average of them, and we'll use that, and maybe that will be a good estimator. Um, 
And so this doesn't work out as well, but we do the same thing. We take our estimator, we substitute it into the expectation um, and, and simplify it. And what you end up getting is this uh, n minus one over n kind of series uh, probability distribution of the, um, the sigma. And um, when you subtract those, you do not get zero, right? Because uh, you're you're missing out on on one of the uh, one of the probabilities. So um, when you um, simplify down from this form and it's not equal to zero, then uh, you don't get uh, you're saying that your your estimator is biased, right? So that means we're in this situation um, where we've learned some um, we have some model and it gives us an estimate that's consistent with that data. It always gives us a number, but it's going to be offset by some amount and you'd have to correct for it or something like that. Um, so Emre had um, a question about what's the difference between bias and estimate error in a bias distribution. It's a good question. I mean, error is different, right? Because um, error, what does error mean? Um, we talked about that before, right? Error is like um, about like the count or, or proportion, it could be depending how you're doing it, um, of how many you got wrong, right? Right, so you have to have a definition of what wrong means. Um, here, what we're, when we're saying that we're hitting the target, we're just saying we're predicting the same value or not. Um, and so you'd have to come up with some metric for, for what the goal was. So if you're in classification and you're trying to get it to be the same label, you want them to be correct. So you could compute distances um, between you know the correct value of the point and each of the wrong ones, right? So you could imagine um, doing that. But if you're doing um, like classification, maybe it's not even just a distance. It's just whether you got this label or that label. So it was a dog or cat and the distance won't be as well defined in that space. So error might depend on what your what your task is, right? Um, because it's about how many you got right and how many you got wrong, the same way we were talking about with that confusion matrix last time. Um, but it definitely affected, right? So it, it's not clear if, it's, if it means one thing versus variance, because it still would have some distance away from your targets. If we just assume that we wanted to hit the red target here, and the distance here is how far you are from the true value, um, a high variance model might give you the same error as a high bias model. So error won't help you distinguish these, right? Because any of these could have the same error as each other. Um, it's just more of bias is a kind of um, reliable um, offset from something, whereas variance is you might be on the target, but f spread around it. Um, so there's lots of different ways you can do this. We'll give you a list of um, formulas, uh, like unbiased estimators for different distributions, which is interesting. Here's another one um, to try on your own. Um, we're trying to estimate the variance of some data. And instead of using the um, sample mean, we're using um, this uh, sigma tilde one, where it's um, basically one over n minus one of, of the, the variance. And you can try and see if that simplifies down to be biased or not. So, right, so that's a good question. Sophia is asking, I said account for the bias. I kind of just said that out there. Um, sometimes you don't know if you can account for it. So what we're really trying to do here is figure out whether um, these are good formulas to use. Like, so if you wanted to basically estimate the variance of some data, this would not be a good way to do it because you know it's going to be biased, right? But now you've got this distance that is always basically under the true thing by this amount. So you could come up with an estimator of this and add it on um, to your, your estimator, maybe to get closer, if for some reason you had to use this one, right? A better idea is to use one that isn't biased. Um, but you could, once you know that it's, because bias means you're always lower than it or always higher than it by a certain amount. Um, so you could try to estimate that amount and, and correct it. It's one thing you could do. Um, so another thing that's important then to talk about is like if we want to assess um, our data, and this does relate actually to the question about error in a way. Um, um, if we uh, use the mean squared error, then we're basically combining um, 
both the variance and the, the bias into one measure, right? And we're saying um, if you're doing well in the mean squared error, then you, you must be, you can't have high bias or variance because you're combining both of them, right? Um, right. So, um, right. So the mean squared error is basically the um, expectation of your of your model um, squared, right? So you take this difference between them, which is already there. Remember, this is a calculation for bias, right? That's the the bias calculation we had, and then you square that, um, and so it gives you this squaring. It basically means so that if this variance is um, high, then you'll magnify it tremendously, right? So high variance um, estimates will um, show up bigger. And when you simplify it down, you can actually get it to be um, equivalent to um, the sum of these two these two formulas, the bias and the variance, right? Um, right, because the variance, we could say, is the, if we come up with the expectation of what our parameter would be from our own parameter, and then uh, say what we expect the value of that to be, we get this, uh, that's how we can get variance. Um, root mean squared error is a, a kind of another just modified form of that. You just take the square root of this. So you basically get rid of the, um, the square. Um, and that helps a bit with magnitude. So if they're, um, you're just looking for really the outlier worst error cases, then you can use that. So an important part about this is um, if your estimator is unbiased, you've got a good estimator, then your mean squared error will be the same as your variance, right? So this whole thing collapses down to just being variance. If you're using one of these perfect estimators that's unbiased, but if you don't know if it's biased or not, because you don't know the formulas that we're trying to solve here, those are these things that we're doing here are only possible in, in simple cases where we know the distribution and we can kind of solve it. In many cases, we're not really going to be able to do this, right? It's a very classical kind of way to do um, model estimation. Um, so um, if you don't know, then uh, mean squared error is good because um, you'll be able to tell that at least if your error, your mean squared error goes down to zero or very low, then you know you're not biased, hopefully. Someone, Christopher, was asking about the difference between quality and effectiveness. You guys have really good questions. Um, those are still pretty, I guess, vaguely defined, so I wouldn't have a formula that defines it. Um, we're talking about quality here. So um, quality usually refers to things like this, like the error, um, you know, correctness, variance, precision, right? So like, is your model good at what it's trying to do? Right. Effectiveness is kind of more general. So if it helps you solve the problem you're doing, then it's effective, right? Um, people often criticized um, neural networks for a long time because they're very effective. Um, they solved their problems, but no one could tell why. And you couldn't be sure of the quality um, because you know, if you trained it wrong or something else went wrong or you didn't have enough data, the answer wouldn't be good, but when it worked, it worked, right? So sometimes things work and um, you can't really say why. And some things look perfect and they're good, but they're not that useful. So uh, yeah, quality and effectiveness, I think, are two big things just to, to keep track of and try to understand why one algorithm is good versus another. Um, but there's no hard answer to it, I don't think. So some of this, um, we talk about um, methodology. I think we talked about this a bit in um, one of the online lectures. So it's a bit of review, but also a bit more detailed on um, one of the methods because it helps us reduce bias. Um, Okay, just got a question about decision trees. Can they be used? Can decision trees be used to find out why what happens happens? And Deep's asking about mean squared error and bias and variance. So that's that's a simpler one to answer. <laughs> I'll skip over Uche's question. Um, mean squared error um, combines uh, variance and bias, right? So it does both. Um, if your model is unbiased, then it's essentially just a variance method. But if you don't know whether your method's uh, estimator is unbiased or not, the mean squared error combines them both seamlessly. So it's, that's why it's a good thing to cover because it's handling those two different sources of error. Um, decision trees, we're not about decision, decision trees next week. So we'll see if it answers all our problems and helps us interpret. Um, nothing helps us 
find out why everything happens and in, in, in gives us full interpretability. So there's no magic bullet for that. Um, the core version of um, decision trees are more interpretable than some of these other models. But again, next week is all decision trees actually. So we'll get to it then. Um, yeah, so we talked about some of these methodology methods before. Um, and um, But now we're gonna focus on the bias part. So one way to deal with bias um, of your model, or even you can say that the, um, in a sense, like your model could be biased because it could be more sensitive to certain data points and be giving, you know, focusing on some of them because your model focuses on certain features or it's better at estimating something. So um, if you happen to be, um, maybe your model is really good at this area of the data set, but your, your data set is biased to have lots of data points over here, right? Um, so you'll be biased um, towards any points that happen to be in the area you're strong on or something, right? There's various different ways bias could show up. You could even say that the data set itself is biased, that you know, um, you're doing population uh, records and you're taking data from people and people in lower income um, neighborhoods don't fill out census forms as much or maybe they don't trust the authorities as much so they, there's less data on them for whatever reason. Um, and so, um, it's biased because you're missing some of that data, right? So you have to be aware of how uh, how you could be um, missing things. Um, and so one way to solve that is to get more data that helps you um, fill in those those gaps. Um, but um, there's also ways to do use sampling to improve that. Um, so we kind of mentioned this briefly in that methodology part, but I think it didn't have as detailed slides as this. So if you think about a simple way to do that, um, what we're trying to do is to say um, we want to get a good um, estimate of how well um, what our model is doing um, with with some data, right? So we want to evaluate uh, how well we're estimating this parameter, say of the mean of of this data. Um, one way to estimate that is to say, well, for every data point, we're just going to take we're going to run our estimator on that one data point. Um, and then we'll compute the mean on all the other data points, right? So it kind of comes to that training, um, testing. It's related to training and testing thing that I talked about in one of the online lectures. So um, say we're making an estimate of the mean. And so uh, to compare it to the, um, the sample, we want to compute the mean over all the other data points. Um, you could do it this way, right? Where you say, I'm just going to compute it on all the other ones. So I is the one we're querying and J are all the other ones. Um, and then uh, we'd basically be computing it on, on those other ones that are remaining. But that's still very focused on, on the single data point. Um, so this uh, K cross validation um, approach basically does that but by dividing the data into to multiple chunks right um, which I said I think we talked about um, but this kind of I didn't have this algorithm I think of them here um, the idea is you've got your, your data going from 1 to n and uh, you divide it into these equal parts and um, for uh, each of these you're going to be uh, computing the values um, for all the other ones right so you'll compute your your parameter, make your estimates on this one, and then um, you'd kind of estimate the, the true parameter um, for it on all the other data um, to compare. And so the idea of this is that um, if the data is biased um, and you've got some points that are kind of much more frequent in certain areas, the chances of you um, being affected by that are gonna be lower, right? Because you're gonna do this um, k times, or we call it k-fold uh, cross-validation, we divide into k boxes, but then we also do it this many times, right? So the first time we, we use this box, and the second time we use this box, and the third time we use this box for estimating, um, and we're going to combine all the different results together. And so this is going to reduce the bias of our estimator as well, because now we're actually going to be focusing it in on different subsets of the data um, while we're, we're fitting it. Um, and then um, 
just related to this idea of bias, we talked about um, sampling with replacement. Um, if you're under, like you know, like we said, some part of the population or, or certain um, certain products you're trying to estimate, you know, popularity of in, in the stores had a reason that their data is missing because people didn't submit it or it was corrupted. You want to oversample that one. You can um, resample that data more um, in order to kind of create that balance. Um, but you're going to be kind of adding some bias to your data on that. But you're trying to correct the bias by essentially filling in, um, like compensating for the data that's missing. But now you're going to be estimating on something uh, a smaller subset, smaller set of data for those samples. Um, so I don't know. Well, the um, k minus l. No, so somebody, uh, France is asking is uh, on cross validation, are you building your estimator on k minus leave part l out? Well, yes, it, it's can't you, you, um, you build it on, on um, the data, um, what are we using for data? D, um, the data minus, um, I guess, D, uh, L, if you get rid of the, the part that you're currently using. So you take that one out and you train it on all the others. Um, but the size of it will be k minus 1, right? Um, because there'll be one less component. 